there you have it. Our, fa our favorite song, always, uh, the call to post, and uh, John Stetton passed the wire. Ready to talk a little Sport of Kings as the uh, Belmont Stakes approaches. Uh, we're a little bit more than a week out. Uh, you know, very exciting time in the Sport of Kings. We've got Justify going for the Triple Crown, and he worked the other day over the Churchill Downs track, where he has been uh, since after he won the Preakness. And, you know, he worked, he worked pretty good. He worked by himself, 46 and change. Uh, looked well within himself and uh, you know one, one of the things that you could pretty much count on when Bob Baffett's horses work well and work fast they generally will run well and run fast so you know Justify looks like he's he's smack on his game uh, he's going to work again similar to the way American Pharaoh did prior to the Belmont uh, so he'll have two works between the Preakness and the Belmont and uh you know, I expect him to work well again, and I expect him to head all over there um, full full steam. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a really exciting day. The undercard is shaping up really, really well. Um, but let's talk about uh, another another three-year-old that's that's not really getting his due from, from, from a lot of people because... Uh, you know, Justify has kind of hogged the three-year-old limelight. And, uh, you know, rightfully so. You know, he's accomplished an awful lot in a short period of time. So, uh, you know, all, all kudos and credits, you know, do him are there. Uh, but, you know, Chad Brown's turf horse, analyze that, is a, is a heck of a nice turf horse. He runs this weekend in the Pennine Ridge uh, at Belmont and... Uh, He's 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 a he's a heck of a a, a racehorse, really is. So uh, you know we've got a really great three year old um, on the dirt, and we've got an equally exciting three year old, or, or, or albeit less accomplished, on the grass. But uh, you know both are really really outstanding prospects and outstanding racehorses already. Uh, interesting, you know we don't know what we'll see from analyze that going forward. Uh, you know, Chad Brown, everybody knows, uh, you know, learned his trade under Bobby Frankel, who was one of the best ever. And uh, Bobby used to do something uh, probably better than anybody I've ever seen in all the years that I've been watching, you know, horses and trainers. Bobby was deadly taking a turf horse and running him on the dirt for the first time. Um... And I made some really big scores with him doing that over the years because I learned that was a move of his. Um, and he was deadly at it. I mean, you know, skimming in the Pacific Classic. It was originally running on turf. Boom, put him on, on, on the dirt. And he would do it in big races, big spots. Um, and one time, um, you know, we all like to talk about the big, big wins. But uh, I also you know, equally talk about the tough beats. And uh, most of you who follow me or read Past the Wire, which you can find at pastorwire.com, my website, um, know that, you know, I'll readily talk about a bad beat as I will a major win. This was a, I can't say it was a bad beat, but it was, uh, it was a play on that angle. I went to the Breeders' Cup that year. It was the year um, Cat Thief won it at the old Gulfstream Park, and I had a beautiful table. Gulfstream treated me very well. They gave me my regular, you know, year-round table for the Breeders' Cup. I loved it. We were, you know, had, had just a phenomenal view. But in the Classic, um, I played that Bobby Frankel angle that I was very familiar with and had been very good to me. Um, and he ran a horse, a Judmont horse, turf horse all the way, had never been on the dirt before, if memory serves correct, and I usually remember those things, um, by the name of Chester House. And he ran him first time dirt in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Most people wouldn't have thought he had a chance, um, but I knew Bobby was so good at that move. And let me tell you, I watched the race on the apron outside, and when they turned for home, he was so far back. Now the clubhouse at Gulfstream, uh, the old Gulfstream was a little bit past the Y at the apron. So, and the restaurant was a, a little bit further past that. And I watched right outside the restaurant because I wanted to watch that race outside. So, I will tell you, when they turned for home, 
He was so far back and so wide, I thought he had absolutely no shot. And if you watch the race today on TV, the replay of Cat Thief's um, race, you probably won't even pick him up on the, on the screen on the pan shot. But outside watching and being very familiar with the colors <clears throat> of Judmont, I saw him swing wide and I saw him coming. And I was like, can this be? Does, this, does he have a shot from back there? He didn't make it. But I can tell you this. When they passed me a little past the wire, he was flying. He was coming. It, was a, it wasn't an almost that anybody could recognize, but it was an almost if you, if you were clocking him and watching him and you knew Bobby's moves, then you knew this, this, this could have really worked out. And it was huge money um, for me. But, you know, he didn't make it. But getting back to that, I would not be surprised at any point to see Chad take a shot would analyze that on the dirt. Um, similar to what, you know, what Bobby did. You know, when, where, whether he's three or four, when he does it remains to be seen. And if he does it remains to be seen because I am speculating, but it would not surprise me. And, and frankly, I would like to see it. So, uh, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Not a lot of other news. Um, you got three grade one winners squaring off in, uh, you know, Santa, at Santa Anita this weekend. We've got uh, Unique Bella, Paradise Woods, and Val Dory uh, going at it. So that should be an exciting and, and, and fun race to watch. And there's not a heck of a lot more news in the sport of kings. Um, China Horse Club is going to run uh, Justify in their silks. Apparently, um, they have some kind of agreement with Windstar Farm. Uh, the co-owner that every fourth start he runs in their silks. I know he ran in Windstar's when he broke his maiden. He ran in uh, China Horse Club uh, second start, and then he's been running in Windstar, you know, since then. And uh, you know, won the Derby and the Preakness in the Windstar silks. And, and uh, you know, people are talking about that. It, it's got no bearing on the outcome of the race. That I assure you. Um, you know, superstition is fun to joke about, and a lot of. A lot, of, a lot of horse players and gamblers in general tend to be superstitious. Doesn't affect the outcome. Uh, doesn't really matter what silks he, wear, he, he, you know, he wears. Uh, you know, Bob Baffert can be a little superstitious as well, uh, from what I understand. So, uh, you know, he might not be, you know, thrilled with the change, but it is what it is. And I don't think anybody who's on the justified bandwagon um, should, should find that as a uh, built-in excuse. Uh, only other thing that's happening is the the legislative session in New York um, is 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 ending. I believe June twentieth. They're trying to uh, get a bill uh, before the floor that would uh, legalize sports gambling this year uh, in the state of New York. I don't think it's going to happen that fast. Even if, you know, first off, the governor is not a fan of gambling. Uh, I don't know to what extent that'll slow it down, but it certainly won't speed it up. Uh, other than that, uh, these guys these guys have a hard time cutting up a sandwich if it comes pre-sliced. So I don't know how they're going to get uh, you know get a bill together that's going to pass that quickly, um, even if they went into desperation mode, which I don't know that they're in or or, or that they're not in. Um, you know, one one a, a couple of things that a lot of people in the racing industry are missing or at least not talking about with the sports gambling thing. Um, you know, I personally don't think it's going to affect racing as much as a lot of other people do. Um, you know, I think, and, 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 you know, I've done a previous broadcast on this. I think that, you know, the horse player and the gambler uh, on sports are pretty much two different animals. They may have some, you know, that are, are, are common to both, but I, I think for the most part are... are are different animals, which I've said, you know, previously. But what, what, what we don't realize or what we're not talking about, I, I mean, obviously we realize, but the, the new, you know, law, what it did was it took away the federal restriction on gambling and it didn't make it legal. It just put it under the jurisdiction of each individual state. So every state has to enact a law, you know, via a bill to legalize sports gambling. And then, and only then, once that happens, will, 
you know, it be determined how racing benefits and or interacts or if any of that money goes towards, you know, purses, horses, horsemen or, or, or retirement or, or anything. You know, right now, none of that's been decided. I, I mean, other than New Jersey, maybe. Um, but, you know, there, there's no entitlement there that I see for the racing industry to benefit. So, you know, how that plays out from state to state, I think remains to be seen. I'm definitely not the most educated person on the subject, uh, you know, not the smartest guy in the room when it comes to that, but common sense, uh, you know, would dictate that uh, there's a lot to be decided and a lot to be worked out from state to state. And, uh, you know, how much it benefits horse racing, I don't know. Again, you know, I think the best shot for it to help the game that we all love is to force competitiveness. Um, that would be a good thing. Force racetracks to, uh, you know, take notice and, uh, you know, provide incentives to make people want to go to the racetrack. Welcome to better, welcome to gambler, provide the tools that he needs and make it a, you know, very, you know, pleasant atmosphere and experience and understand what your customer wants, which is really no headaches, all the tools and a smooth way to be able to handicap, do what they have to do, and, uh, you know, play the game that they love. And that's that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And that's pretty much it. You're up to date now on uh, all the news that's fit to broadcast. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Uh, you could always read more at PastorWire.com. Uh, wrote an article for Amwager this week. If you didn't catch it, um, it was about... Uh, a great five days in the history of, of, of horse racing and the start of an unbelievable streak. Uh, it involved the Met Mile and the Belmont Stakes and two unbelievable uh, editions of both. It's up on PastorWire.com. You can catch it at my column on Amwager as well, um, either site. And uh, if you enjoy these videos, come back for more, subscribe. Uh, always happy to broadcast and share some, some thoughts and uh, love hearing from everybody, getting a lot of messages, a lot of comments. That's always nice. So uh, I try and address everything that I, uh, that I can. So thanks for stopping by and, uh, you know, visit the YouTube channel, visit PastorWire.com, check out Amwager as well. And uh, thanks again and uh, ciao for now.